Crisis-Driven Innovation I wrote this blog last year, when at that time the only big crisis we were worrying about was Brexit here in the UK. But looking at it now from a standpoint where we're facing something much more serious, it still seems that there are some useful messages. Imagine you're flying over the Sahara Desert. Your plane runs into a sandstorm. The engines splutter and then die one by one until there's just the sound of sand rasping against the windows. The nose dips. You feel a dreadful lurching in the pit of your stomach. The world outside the window turns black and you crash. Miraculously, no one is hurt. But the plane is smashed, the radio is destroyed, and your last known position was over a hundred miles from anywhere. What do you do? Fortunately, this isn't real. It's the plot of a novel called The Flight of the Phoenix. But it does offer a powerful reminder of the ways in which human creativity can get us out of trouble. In this particular scenario, there's just enough of an airframe left, plus a trickle of fuel and one engine which could be coaxed back to life. The plane had carried a strange mixture of passengers with different skills and experience, including an old man who used to design aeroplanes. To cut a long story short, they managed to assemble a new aeroplane which just holds together long enough for them to fly back to safety. The phoenix of the title. That might be fiction, but we don't have to look too far to see similar stories playing out in real life. Crisis provides a trigger for innovation. Not least because doing nothing is not an option, even if conventional solution pathways are blocked. For example, when Haiti was hit by a devastating hurricane in 2010, much of the city of Port-au-Prince lay in ruins. Within a very short time, aid workers and locals began to piece together makeshift solutions to their problems, using resources such as mobile phones and a cellular connection. Solutions which they co-created and diffused widely included using the mobile phone network to create an instant banking system across which aid agencies could distribute cash to buy food, medicines and other essentials. Or open street mapping to provide up-to-date information about affected populations, damaged infrastructure, key emergency locations and so on or reuniting displaced persons using the phone network as a database and communication centre, or mobilising 3D printing technology to create instant emergency spare parts, and in the process co-opting an international network of volunteer designers providing key software information to help make this happen, and providing translation services, making urgent information available in local dialects, once again, using the internet and an international volunteer army of translators to help in the process. Or well, back in 1943, at the height of the Second World War, a small team at Lockheed's Burbank factory in the United States were given the apparently impossible task of designing and building a jet aircraft within six months. And they'd never built a jet before, so there were no designs to work from. The technology was unknown. The only engine was in the UK and wouldn't be available to them to experiment with until near the end of the project. Oh, and the factory was already working flat out on producing bombers for the war effort. Kelly Johnson was the man appointed to run this project. And one of his first tasks was to rent a circus tent to work in because there was no space available for his team. Time was of the essence. The Germans were already flying their jet fighter at speeds twice that of Allied aircraft and been working on this technology since 1938. Yet despite all these barriers, Kelly's Skunk Works team achieved their target with weeks to spare, producing and safely flying the shooting star. Now Toyota wasn't always the great car maker we know today. Back in the post-war years, Japan's slow and painful recovery was hampered by resource shortages, its physical infrastructure still severely damaged, and skilled labour in very short supply. All of this on an island economy which had to import most of its key industrial resources. The stuttering local car market was small and fragmented. 
Under these conditions, it was impossible to run a car factory in the profligate style associated with mass production. Working under these constraints forced experiments towards a radically different approach to manufacturing, one which emphasised reduced waste at every stage. From these unhappy beginnings, and via a long learning process, the idea of lean was born, one which went on to become one of the most powerful process innovations of the 20th century. Crisis also plays a role in the world of the arts. For example, every time the Royal Shakespeare Company performs, it faces the challenge of short timescales and the need to find something new in a repertoire limited to 37 plays. And it has to take into account that they've all been performed many times over the past 400 years. Their challenge, which audience numbers and critics' reviews regularly suggest they succeed in, involves finding new ways to push the edges of the audience experience. So something is going on here which is clearly not about having lots of resources. Instead, it's often the shortage of them which forces a different mindset. It's also about roadblocks. The obvious way ahead is impassable, and so we need to find a new route. Crisis triggers a new and different kind of search, one with a number of important characteristics. Firstly, ends, not means, drive the process. The presence of a challenging vision compels innovation, even if the ways of reaching the goal are unclear. Extensive search, because the normal pathways may be blocked, the search for solutions pushes out into new and unfamiliar territory. Reframing, being able to see the problem from a fresh perspective. Creatively combining, improvising solutions from whatever's available, often in novel configurations. Experimental learning, improvising and building on what emerges, early prototyping, fast, intelligent failure. And tolerance of imperfection, and then incremental continuous improvement towards a more optimal solution. Crisis provides a trigger for thinking differently. There's a clue in the etymology. The word comes from the Greek and means turning point. Not necessarily a negative thing, but certainly a change in direction. The Chinese characters for crisis capture this well. The word is assembled from two pictograms, one for threat and the other for opportunity. And psychology tells us something about why crisis can provide a useful trigger. Human beings have evolved as problem solvers, but we're also rather lazy. Faced with a challenge, our first response is to search our mental repertoire of existing solutions and try to pull one off the shelf. We might need to adapt it a little, but we generally like an easy plug-and-play strategy. But if that doesn't work, we engage in an active search for something new. We might feel annoyed, frustrated, might even grumble about the work we're being required to do. But the chances are we'll eventually end up with a new solution. This isn't just a feeling. Research shows that the brain is actively forcing new neural connections and pathways during this kind of search process. In studies at the University of Amsterdam, it appears that obstacles and constraints actually help the creative process. So sometimes creativity doesn't flourish as well as it might in comfortable, resource-rich environments. It seems to thrive under difficult conditions. As Google and many other organisations have come to recognise, creativity loves constraints. One reason our thinking often stays inside the box is that it's very comfortable there. And that's where crisis comes in. It forces us to move, not least because the normal trajectory is blocked off in some way and we have to follow a diversion. Necessity becomes a rather harsh mother of invention. Research on problem solving not only helps us understand this challenge, but also suggests ways in which we might break out of the comfortable box. For example, Carl Duncker's famous candle experiment reminds us about functional fixedness, we make assumptions about what we can and cannot use. Given the problem of sticking a candle to the wall to provide illumination and being supplied with only drawing pins and matches, many solvers fail to see that they might be able to make use of the box in which the drawing pins or matches are supplied. Similarly, Gestalt theory teaches us that we're pattern recognisers. 
and sometimes seeing alternative patterns is hard work until we receive a nudge. Think about those 3D pictures which take time to reveal their hidden content. Or those familiar brain teasers which remind us of how focusing on one pattern blocks out our ability to see an alternative. Or the phenomenon of mindset, Einstellung, which means we often try to apply familiar solution approaches to unfamiliar situations. Essentially, it's a reminder that to a man with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. But there might be alternative tools that we could use. So, how might we use some of these insights and construct a toolkit to help our organisation use crisis as a way of triggering radical innovation? Well, here are five possible pathways to explore. First, build a compelling vision. Now, a familiar theme in change management is the role played by the burning platform. These focus the mind wonderfully on the need to change and the direction we should take. Of course, the trouble with burning platforms is that they're hot. The trick is to avoid getting burned. And this is where simulations and thought experiments can play a role. Creating a compelling vision to a focus attention while still giving us room to explore. And one way of doing this is through the use of futures techniques like scenario planning. Scenarios are rich narratives, stories, in which we can explore challenges and work out our responses safely. Shell's pioneering use of this helped them think the unthinkable and prepare for it in the context of major oil price shocks. And there's a famous paper describing how Hyundai used crisis construction as a tool for breaking the dominant and comfortable thinking pattern within their automotive division. Jack Welch's famous challenge given to his divisional managers at GE when he was trying to get them to come up with radical innovations around an internet strategy offers another powerful version of this approach. He simply asked them to think like entrepreneurs, looking at how they might destroy their business. Reframing offers another valuable tool. Seeing the problem through different eyes, redefining it in ways which open up new directions. Entrepreneurs are skilled at this, looking at an existing business model and figuring out ways to upset the apple cart. Not for nothing did Joseph Schumpeter, the godfather of innovation studies, put creative destruction at the centre of his thinking. His gales have blown through an uncomfortably large list of sectors with disruptive results. Think about low-cost airlines, music distribution, city mobility or accommodation, for example. But the trouble is that reframing thinking like an entrepreneur is easy enough to talk about, but like that alligator-filled swamp, hard to focus on when their teeth are snapping at your ankles. In particular, reframing for established organisations often means letting go of your past, leaving behind historical models which have served you well. Take the imaging industry, one which has certainly experienced a crisis, as in a turning point, with the arrival of digital photography. Kodak's well-documented story is one of an organisation in some ways incapable of letting go and reframing fast enough, despite having some powerful cards, including the first digital camera and a sheaf of patents around the technology in its hands. By contrast, Fujifilm made a more successful transition, using its new eyes to see where else its core knowledge base might be deployed. Coating surfaces with precision at micro scale is a valuable capability, not only in imaging, but also in fields like cosmetics and healthcare, sectors in which Fujifilm have now become significant players. Creatively combine. Try using elements or reusing elements from one place in a different context. Bricolage is a phrase used to describe the ways in which entrepreneurs make use of anything available to them to create new solutions. That's very much what our passengers on the Phoenix aeroplane did. This kind of scrap heap challenge style of flexible thinking underpins many examples of what's called frugal innovation, an approach which looks to simplify and combine as a source of innovation. Take the case of Dr. Venkataswamy and the Aravind eye care system. His radical approach to developing low-cost, reliable cataract surgery for the poor in rural India borrowed ideas from the world of fast food and manufacturing. The model works. 
the average cost of an operation is $25 compared to $300 in a typical Indian hospital. And it's delivered using largely unskilled labor trained in narrowly focused areas. 40 years on from his innovation and millions of people around the world owe their sight to his innovation. And his ideas influenced people like Devi Shetty and others to pioneer similar approaches to operations as complex as heart bypass surgery. Again, massively lowering the costs without compromising on the safety element. By definition, he wasn't going to find his answers in the world of healthcare. Instead, he found parallel versions of his problem in widely different fields and then adapted the solutions. This idea of recombinant innovation was also one which served Thomas Edison well in operating his invention factory way back at the turn of the 20th century. Another approach is to make use of the idea of experimenting and failing. Innovations like making omelettes, you can't do it without breaking eggs. Organisations like Pixar, who have a reputation for being able to repeat the innovation trick, don't do so by accident. They're built on a culture of experiment. Successful entrepreneurship involves a strong element of play, but it also requires a safe environment, a playground in which to do so. And that's where the idea of innovation labs, laboratories, comes in. Essentially, a lab is somewhere where controlled experimentation can happen. Risks can be taken and intelligent failure can operate. Innovation labs have become increasingly popular, but there's a risk that many of these are little more than a trendy environment, some soft cushions and a slogan. To make them work requires appropriate facilities, methodologies and catalytic facilitation. We're only now beginning to understand the key characteristics of such powerful innovation spaces. And that leads on to the idea of prototyping. A key role which labs play is that they provide environments in which different players can gather together around prototypes. Prototypes are essentially boundary objects. They make ideas visible in their early half-formed state and they provide an opportunity for different people to shape and adapt them. And a powerful source of such prototyping input comes from users. Research shows consistently that users offer a rich source of early-stage innovation ideas. For many of them, the frustrations of their particular situation, their crises, drives them to create early prototypes which can provide the basis for developing radical solutions. In similar fashion, finding extreme users who try to solve their problems under crisis conditions offer us some powerful new insights into mainstream markets. Extreme users have to be active experimenters, tolerant of failure, because that's the way they learn about what might work. It's a tricky world out there, and we'd all rather avoid crises, have a quiet life. But given that they are going to happen, and that innovation actually flourishes in such a context, it might be worth rehearsing some of these skills to help exploit the next one. (laughs) 